Good morning, again. Turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 7. We're going to be studying verses 17 through 29 this morning. Acts chapter 7, verses 17 through 29. Stephen has been brought before the council. Uh, The synagogues were alarmed because they can't dispute with him. He's too wise. He knows the scriptures too well. Uh, They're trying to argue against him, but they can't debate with him. And so they trump up charges. They bring him to the council. They say he's destroying everything and all of their customs. And so the council gives him an opportunity to speak, and he speaks for a long time. If you're visiting with us, we're really jumping right in the middle today of a speech that we've been progressing through together. Um, Two weeks ago, we heard... um, a whole set of astounding promises that God gave to Abraham. Stephen, before the council, as he's defending himself, uh, he's, he's remembering these promises to Abraham that his descendants are going to be many and they're going to get to live in the land and uh, that God is going to be faithful to those promises. Last week, Ramiro came and preached and, and he preached about uh, one of the ways that that faithfulness had begun to be shown, shown by the Lord that the people, Abram's descendants, um, <clears throat> there was a famine in their land and God had already provided for them a deliverer, a deliverer that they despised, uh, but someone that was sent down to Egypt ahead of them uh, in God's providence, and that's Joseph. Well, today we're going to see the same thing, a similar thing, that God sent another deliverer, and this deliverer as well would be despised even though he was provided by God, and that's Moses. I think that you can see where Stephen is heading. Uh, It's not going to be pretty for the people that are listening there. Uh, he's, He's recounting how God sent Joseph, but Joseph was despised. God sent Moses, but Moses was despised. At the end of his speech, Stephen is going to say this, You stiff-necked people uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. That is the sharp rebuke that we're waiting for In Stephen's speech, as he recounts all this history and he remembers how all of the prophets were rejected by the people and now this generation has not just rejected another prophet, this generation has rejected the the righteous one himself. He's telling them that they are people who pretend to love the law. They pretend to treat it as the the law has been delivered by angels. It's Angels, it is something to be honored and revered, and then they don't keep it. They disobey the law in their actions and their words. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They're pretending to love the prophets and love the Old Testament scriptures, but again, just like their fathers, they're despising the one that was among them, and they're not listening to the prophets who came before Well, in the midst of it all, uh, there is a massive, bright, shining light. Uh, In the midst of all this darkness of remembering how the people rejected Joseph and rejected Moses and rejected all of the prophets, in the midst of this darkness of now this generation in Stephen's day has rejected the Messiah, there is this massive, bright, shining light, and that is the light of a faithful God who keeps his promises in spite of what his people are doing. He keeps his promises in the most astounding ways. And that's how our text begins. Look at verse 17. Acts chapter 7, verse 17, Stephen says, But as the time of the promise drew near, which God had granted to Abraham. We heard those promises a couple weeks ago. 
Now God is remembering that promise. Centuries later, he's remembering his promises to Abraham. The time is drawing near for him to fulfill those promises, to bring the people back to the land. And so as that time draws near, today we're going to read about two blessings in progress for the nation of Israel. Two blessings in progress as the time of promise draws near. Two blessings in progress. That's multiplication and deliverance. Follow along as I read Acts chapter 7, verses 17 through 29. But as the time of the promise drew near, which God had granted to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt until there arose over Egypt another king who did not know Joseph. He dealt shrewdly with our race and forced our fathers to expose their infants so that they would not be kept alive. At this time, Moses was born, and he was beautiful in God's sight. And he was brought up for three months in his father's house. And when he was exposed, Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and brought him up as her own son. Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in his words and deeds. When he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them being wronged, he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. And on the following day, he appeared to them as they were quarreling and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brothers. Why do you wrong each other? But the man who was wronging his neighbor thrust him aside, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want me to do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? At this retort, Moses fled and became an exile in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. Pray with me. Father, as we come to this passage and study it together, we pray that you'd give us sharp minds that you'd help us not be distracted, that you'd give us humble hearts, willing to learn, not pretending that we're perfect, not pretending that we have perfect knowledge of your word, but instead humbly coming to learn again, learn from your word, see what you've written. As we study this speech from Stephen, we pray that you would help us. Help us remember our Old Testament history. Help us remember you and your character and how you are delivering your people. Help us learn and have obedient hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the first blessing in progress for Israel is multiplication. Look, look at verse 17. But as the time of promise drew near, which God had granted to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt until there arose over Egypt another king who did not know Joseph. He dealt shrewdly with our race and forced our fathers to expose their infants so that they would not be kept alive. So Stephen, 2,000 years before us, is remembering events 2,000 years before him. Uh, Stephen, 2,000 years before us in this speech, is remembering events 2,000 years before him that God gave these promises to Abraham. And centuries later, still 1,500 years before Stephen, uh, centuries later, the time of fulfilling those promises is drawing near. The time of promise is drawn near. It's time for God's people to come out. And so God, in his providence, is causing circumstances that are going to lead to Israel's deliverance. The first of those circumstances is that Israel is increasing and multiplying greatly in Egypt. This is a good thing, right? Uh, We should read this as being in fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham that he's going to cause nations to come from Abraham. That this specific nation is going to grow and multiply. 500 years earlier, this promise would have been completely unbelievable. uh, Except that it was God who made it. Uh, Old Abram 
and old, barren Sarah. They had never been able to get pregnant. Now they don't just have a few descendants. They have descendants that are multiplying into a nation. And that multiplication is happening at a great rate. Multiplying greatly. It says it like this in in Exodus. It says, The people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land, that's the land of Egypt, the land was filled with them. There were Hebrews everywhere. There were so many of them. Well, this good thing, this fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham, it quickly becomes a bad thing from an earthly perspective. Uh, Because Stephen quotes from Exodus when he says, There arose over Egypt another king who did not know Joseph. This new Pharaoh, this new king, he was greatly alarmed that there were so many Hebrews. He was greatly alarmed that they were everywhere. And so, verse 19, he dealt shrewdly with our race Enforced our fathers to expose their infants so that they would not be kept alive. This king, this pharaoh, starts a murder campaign against these children, specifically the males. And so the Hebrews are forced to leave their children out in the open, uh, exposed to the elements. Just like Moses was in, their, in the river, you remember. Uh, Moses being left out. So you can see that Stephen is saying that God remembered his promise and he is multiplying the people, but that multiplication led to their oppression, severe mistreatment of the Israelites, uh, mistreated by cruel taskmasters. Listen to what it says in Exodus. It says, they made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work of the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. That was Exodus 1. 14. Because the Pharaoh and the Egyptians were so scared that the Hebrews were multiplying so greatly because of God's blessing, they try and crack down, make life miserable for them. And on top of that, they try and annihilate an entire generation of Hebrew males. But even this difficult oppression is a blessing from the Lord. Uh, This is the circumstance that God is going to use to cause the people of Israel to cry out and to groan to him. It's this circumstance that as the people groan, as they pray, the scriptures say that God hears those groanings. And he knows what they're going through. He knows that they're suffering and he decides to step in. These circumstances really are perfect for exactly what God is trying to accomplish for the nation of Israel. That when it's time for them to come out, uh, the nation's not going to be split, right? There's not going to be some that stay back and say, you know, life's pretty good here in Egypt. Uh, We'll send some back. That's what it's like when they're in the return from Babylon, right? Only some, only a small number go back. For Egypt, it's a totally different story. They are longing to escape. There's not an Israelite in the country that's thinking, oh, this life is pretty good. I'm going to stay here and live with my Egyptian family. No, they long to escape, and so they are going to be thrust out as a single unified nation in God's providence. God is faithfully keeping his promise to them in every way. He multiplies them, and though that leads to their oppression, it also is going to lead to their deliverance. In our Sunday school class, we've um, recently studied Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And we've really been struggling with a lot of the realities in the book of Ecclesiastes. They've been so good for us to hear, but they've been difficult to accept some of these truths. Hard to stomach that God has made everything beautiful in its time, the author says. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from beginning to end. That's Ecclesiastes 3, verse 11. He says in verse 14, I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. Verse 22, so I saw there's nothing better 
than that a man should rejoice in his work, for that is his lot. Who can bring him to see what will be after him? There's a clear reality in the scriptures that we don't know what comes before us and what comes after us. A generation comes and goes. We don't know what the Lord is bringing tomorrow or in the next year or in the next generation. We have no idea. It's the Lord who's in charge of the seasons, and that should cause us to fear. We don't know when a blessing is going to lead to a trial, just like the blessing of multiplication leads to the oppression of the Israelites. We don't know when a trial is going to lead to a blessing, uh, just like the oppression of Israel is going to lead to their soon deliverance. We're not God, and we can't tell the future. We don't know how long a season is going to last. And so the only right response in Ecclesiastes is to fear him and to trust him and to obey him, to enjoy the season that he's given you. You don't know when this season is going to end. For the Israelites, God had made promises to them, but they didn't know the winding, difficult path that would lead to the the fulfillment of of those promises, right? It was centuries, 400 years they were enslaved in Egypt. Well, God has made promises to you as well, if you're a believer, that in the coming ages that God would show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. But you don't know the winding path that leads to those immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. You don't know all the trials. You don't know all the seasons. And so the only right response as we experience God's blessing, as we experience trial, the only right response is to trust him, to remember that he's the God who gives and the God who takes away. We trust him in blessing. We trust him in trial. Well, that's the first blessing is multiplication. The second blessing in progress for Israel is deliverance. It hasn't happened yet, uh, but the, the process has started in Stephen's speech. Look at verse 20. Stephen says, at this time Moses was born, and he was beautiful in God's sight. And he was brought up for three months in his father's house. And when he was exposed... Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in his words and deeds. Sometimes when you read biography, I don't know how many of you ever read biography, but sometimes when you read biography, you can just get struck by the fact that at the right time in history, Uh, God has brought the perfect person for just that situation. You know, I think that sometimes when I read about uh, the biography of somebody like Martin Luther, I think that if I met Martin Luther, I'd be very uncomfortable. I don't know if I'd be friends with Martin Luther. He seems fiery. He seems like uh, he might say some things that I don't want to hear. But for that time in history, that was exactly the kind of person that was needed. And the Lord used him. Uh, The same thing about even George Washington, just in secular history. You know, uh, someone who is so quirky in so many ways. uh, You know, who, who does, who always insists on having the right posture from the time he's a young man? Uh, Who has such a knowledge of economics and farming and warfare and government and just everything? Just when he was needed, God seemed to provide these people. Well, in his providence, this is the kind of thing that Stephen is saying about Moses. If you got to handcraft the perfect deliverer for the people of Israel, even though later he might not think so. He might think that his tongue isn't good or his speech isn't good. But if you got to handcraft the perfect deliverer for Israel, it is Moses. Stephen says he was beautiful in God's eyes that he was born as a Hebrew, even got to be nursed in his father's home. But then he was adopted by a daughter of Pharaoh and raised in a royal house. Hebrew by ethnicity, but raised as a prince, somebody who could make changes for the nation of Israel in this land of Egypt. 
Verse 22, Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in his words and deeds, schooled in every way. Sometimes we have kind of fantastical dreams and hopes that we're praying for for our government, right? You know, wouldn't it be amazing if the president of the United States didn't just profess to be a believer, but really just fell in love, head over heels for the scriptures and wanted to honor Christ in everything he did. And not just the president, but the vice president. Not just the vice president, but the whole uh, house of representatives and the speaker of the house. Not just all of them, but the Supreme Court. What if they all just went crazy about the scriptures and loved the Lord with all of their heart? I think if you lived in Moses' day, if you were having those fantastical dreams of exactly what could come true for your nation of Israel and Egypt, I think it would be something exactly like what God provided in Moses. One of us, a Hebrew, not just friends with the royal house, not just trusted by the royal house, but raised in the royal house adopted into the royal family. This is perfect. And on top of that, he is instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. He is mighty in words and deeds. There is no better deliverer possible than Moses, handcrafted for this situation. And so at the perfect age for good leadership, He is ready and prepared. And look at verse 23. When he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them being wronged, he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand. But they did not understand. On the following day, he appeared to them as they were quarreling and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brothers. Why do you wrong each other? But the man who was wronging his neighbor thrust him aside, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? At this retort, Moses fled and became an exile in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. So here he is, this perfect deliverer, handcrafted by God, perfectly placed, provided for by God, protected by God from an early age, ready to step in, ready to defend his people, ready to help them reconcile. They don't want him. Who are you? Who made you judge over us? Now Moses has nobody, right? The Egyptians aren't going to accept him. He murdered an Egyptian to defend a Hebrew. Now the Hebrews don't want him either. Who made you judge? So he just has to flee. God is still going to use him as a deliverer later in another 40 years. They've already been oppressed uh, more harshly for these past 40 years. Now another 40 years are going to go by before they're delivered. Moses is going to deliver them uh, when he's 80, not when he's 40. They despised their deliverer. You can see what Stephen is getting at, right? We know where Stephen is going. He's about to point his finger right at these Jewish leaders and say, you're doing the same thing. You're the sons of your father's. Just like they rejected Joseph, just like they rejected Moses, you're rejecting Jesus Christ, the righteous one. There isn't a better deliverer. There isn't anyone who fulfills the scriptures like Jesus Christ does. There's no other option. There's no other deliverer. He is perfect in every way. God has handcrafted this deliverer to forgive your sins and deliver the nation Israel. We don't want them, they say. Who made you judge and ruler over us? Well, Stephen is going to bring this rebuke crashing down on them later in the speech. Uh, We'll leave it till then to continue to talk about. But today, let's focus on God's faithfulness. You know, sometimes we, as a family, we like to watch those cooking competition shows. You ever watch those? Uh, Shows like MasterChef or the other ones? 
Uh, they're always better cooks than I am. I don't know how they have that much knowledge to be able to cook all those things. But that's not the only thing that's impressive about them. They're also master organizers. They have so many plates spinning. Uh, I guess that's a different analogy. But they have so many plates spinning. You know, they have to get everything ready at the right time. The, the meat has to be cooked well enough so it's not going to make someone sick. Uh, but not too much because then it's going to be burnt. And it has to be ready right at the right time. The vegetables too. They have to be soft enough to eat but still a little bit crunchy. Um, you know, cook just the perfect time, the bread and the rice, everything coming out so that the meat and the, the vegetables and the, the, the bread, they all come out at the same time. And then on top of all that, they're, they're all stressed out and everybody's yelling, yes, chef. And uh, they have to plate it in the right way so that it's right for the judges. Everything's perfectly organized as they get it right down on the plate. Well, the scriptures make it clear that God is the master organizer when it comes to these extremely difficult and improbable promises that he's fulfilling. He has told an old man and an old woman who have no business bearing children. He's told an old man and an old woman that they're going to have many descendants and they're going to live in this land. But everything has to be perfectly orchestrated by a master organizer, because the time for them to live in the land is not yet. The scriptures say that the time of the Amor- or the iniquity of the Amorites is not complete yet. It's not time for them to be kicked out of the land. It's not time for them to live there. And so in the land is not the place where they're going to grow into this mighty nation. Instead, the Lord causes circumstances for them to leave, incubate, and grow in another nation before they come back, when it is time to come back. And so God causes this famine, and God has perfectly placed and carefully placed a deliverer waiting for them down in Egypt, Joseph, the brother that they despised. God took care of all of that so that they could come and be treated well in the land of Egypt, at least for a generation. So many spinning plates, right? We're talking world history, a master organizer, not just over dishes, uh, but over world history. We'll see as we continue that the spinning plates don't stop. He causes them to be multiplied at just the right time. He causes them to be oppressed at just the right time. And then he again provides this deliverer, perfectly prepared, carefully placed, Moses. And it doesn't stop there. Uh, There's much left to be done. Uh, Israel has been cooked in Egypt, but they haven't been plated yet in the land. Uh, And so he needs to bring them out. He needs to give them their law in Mount Sinai. They need to travel with the tabernacle. All of this with with all the world nations at just the right time for them to be kicked out of the land. And of course, all the miracles along the way. God has this special plan as a master organizer to not just empty the land before them so that it's a desolate wasteland, but carefully, one people group at a time to kick the people out so that the the people of Israel get to inhabit homes, vineyards already planted, cisterns already filled. You know, when we read this set of promises to Israel, we, it sounds so simple. You're going to have descendants, they're going to live in this land. But as we see it unfold in scripture, we see that there were so many miracles on the way. God is this master organizer over human history, carefully placing these deliverers at just the right time in their history, carefully orchestrating world history. Well, God is still the master organizer today. Just as in the life of Israel, he was able to keep all the plates spinning in world history, to perfectly provide the complete place for a completed nation at the completed time. In the same way, he carefully measures out everything in your life. He knows you. The scriptures say that he has searched you and known you. He searched out your path and your lying down. He's acquainted with all your ways. The scriptures say that he knows the the number of the hairs on your head. The scriptures say that your father knows what you need, your food and your clothing. Your father knows what you need. He knows you. 
Your Father knows how to work everything for good in your life as a believer, even trials. The scriptures say that he is faithful. Listen to 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It says, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. He is this master organizer. He is this faithful one keeping his promises to you in your life. You are not some insignificant thing that he's forgotten about as you're in some mindless trial that your father doesn't know about. The scriptures make it clear he is the master organizer. He has carefully measured out everything in your life. And any time you are tempted, there is this way of escape that he's provided. He's not going to let that spinning plate crash to the ground. What does it look like in your life as a believer if you're going to trust this? Some would assume that we need to slow down enough to meditate so that when we're in a trial, we can see what God is doing in that trial, and then we can find joy because we see what he's doing. But wisdom would say that we don't know what God is doing. He's operating on a totally different level than us. And sometimes later, maybe we see part of a reason why a trial was in our life, as we get to use that to bless someone else, or we get to see how we grew But I think normally God is operating on a completely different level than us. We don't see everything that's going on. So what is the call? What does it look like for us to trust that God is faithful, that he's keeping all his promises to us as this master organizer, just like he did for the nation of Israel? Well, let's let a few of the apostles apply this. Listen to Paul. Paul says, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. That's one application, right? If we're really trusting that he is this perfect master organizer and he knows every little detail in our life, if we really trust that, well, then we're going to be content in abundance or in need. Peter, he says, therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. There's another application for us, right? If we're believing that he is the sovereign organizer over our life, well, then we get to just trust him while we do good. What about James? The Apostle James, verse 13 of chapter 4, James says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. Be humble another application. If we believe that he's the master organizer and we're not, then we're going to be humble. I think we could keep going. We could go on more and more applications of this, right? Of, of understanding that he's the one that's keeping his promises. But at the very least, you're going to be humble, not pretending you know the future, not pretending you know what's best, but being humble. You're going to be content like the Apostle Paul. And while you are humble and content, you're going to do good, like Peter says, entrusting your soul to a faithful creator. And in seemingly every way, the leaders in Stephen's day are doing the opposite of this, right? They are seeing the signs that the apostles are doing. They had already seen the signs that Christ did. They're seeing the signs that the apostles are doing. They're seeing that they cannot argue with Stephen. But they're ignoring the signs in their arrogance. They're inflamed with jealousy towards the apostles and inflamed with jealousy towards Stephen. 
They are bent on stopping Stephen, whatever the moral cost. They don't care. They wanted to stop Jesus. They wanted to stop the apostles. Now they want to stop Stephen, whatever the cost. In short, they're arrogant, not humble. They're jealous and discontent, not content. They're doing evil. They're not doing good. But as we follow the example of Stephen and others like him, I think we should strive to do the opposite. If we really understand what Stephen understands, that God is the God of history, and he's the master organizer, then that is going to make us be humble, be content, and do good while we trust the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would help us do this. Um, Help us act this way. Help us show it in our actions that we really do trust you, that you are in charge. That there's nothing outside of your control. We pray that you would help us rid ourselves of the anxiety and the worry of pretending like you're not in control. Help us rid ourselves of the arrogance that comes from pretending that we're in control. Help us trust you with all of our heart, recognizing that you are the master organizer. Father, we do pray that as we continue through this speech that you'd help us persevere, that you'd help us remember all this Old Testament history, that you'd help us learn it well, see it with the right eyes as we remember your faithfulness, your perfect provision of a deliverer who is the right man at the right time for the nation of Israel. Help us see and learn and trust you. Learn to be humble. In Jesus' name.